All right, you knew this was coming. Since we did trig functions, we're going to have to find their inverses, just as we did when we had exponential functions, we found their inverses. The nice thing about the exponential functions, though, was that they were what we called one-to-one, -one, meaning no y value ever repeated, so we didn't need to do anything special to make their inverse be a function, as we discussed during the first week. We will not be so lucky with our trig functions. For example, if somebody says to you, solve the equation sine of x equals one-half, that means find the value of x where the sine is one-half, how many possible answers are there going to be? I've drawn here the graph of sine of x, and here's a y value of a half. So you might say the answer is pi over 6. You'd be right. Your friend might say the answer is 5 pi over 6. Your friend would be right. Somebody else might say negative 7 pi over 6, 13 pi over 6. How many different possible answers are there? There are infinitely many answers. But when you ask your calculator, what is the inverse sine of 1 half, does it give you infinitely many different answers? It does not. Does it give you a different answer every time? It does not. Does your calculator div give you a different answer than somebody's calculator across the room or across the world? It does not. They all give the same one. And in fact, for this, when we ask what is the inverse sine of a half, they all give the answer of pi over 6, even though there's many, many different possible answers. So uh, there's going to be infinitely many possible answers here. So as we did last week with the x squared function, where we said the inverse of the square, we always get a non-negative answer. So the square root of 9 is always 3, never negative 3. The whole planet agreed on that. So as we discussed last week, we need to restrict the domain of sine of x and of cosine of x and of tangent of x in order for them to have inverses that are actually functions. So the idea is, and we'll have you do this in an applet in a second, you want to find some part of the domain of sine of x where there are no repeat y values and you get all possible y values from minus 1 to 1. And do the same with cosine and do the same for tangent, except tangent you need to get all the y values from minus infinity to infinity. In other words, we'd like you to fill in the blanks for these definitions. Sine inver inverse sine of x, which is also called arc sine of x, is the angle between somewhere and somewhere whose sine is x. So by looking at the graph, and the same with cosine and tangent, by looking at those three graphs in the applet that we're going to have you explore with, find a region of the domain where all the y values appear and no y value appears twice. Now it is true that you could each come up with your own, but there is a natural one for each, a sort of simplest one, and that is the one that, as we said, everybody on the planet, every calculator, every computer on the planet has all agreed that that's how we're going to restrict them. So we really will be able to fill in these six blanks with something that is universally agreed upon. So please go and explore with the applet. Try to come up with your own idea to fill in these six blanks, and we will fill them in together.